Hey, welcome to the channel. Just some quick context before we get started. This video is a compilation of three separate reviews that I put out for these games about a year ago to coincide with Spooktober and the release of Netflix's Castlevania Nocturne. They didn't exactly do big numbers at the time, so I decided to combine them into one long one now that the Dominus collection has been shadow dropped and just see how it does. I've done my best to edit around any comments made in reference to each video's original release context, but please forgive any circumstantial jank or dated references that may have escaped me. These did originally release around Halloween of 2023. Alright, enjoy the video. Castlevania one of the most legendary franchises in all of gaming. Unfortunately, these days it's as dead as Dracula's cold, unbeating heart, trapped in the catacombs of Konami's IP vault, but like a vampire rising from its coffin, it resurrects itself in my replay queue quite frequently. And so, in honor of the spooky season and the launch of Netflix's Castlevania Nocturne, this year I want to take a moment to give a little love to some of its more unsung entries. To be clear, I wouldn't call the DS trilogy of Egovania's underrated per se, as they have a good reputation amongst fans and critics, but they do tend to live in the shadow of their father game, Symphony of the Night. So for now, let's let Symphony bow out of the spotlight and shine it instead on some of my personal favorite entries in this delightfully macabre series, kicking things off with Castlevania Dawn of Sorrow, the game that got me into the series in the first place. Dawn's predecessor Aria of Sorrow still gets a lot of love on YouTube. And, I mean, it's well-deserved. I adore that game as well, but I feel like Dawn gets left out of the conversation a lot. For starters, the mere fact that Soma Cruz, the heroic reincarnation of Dracula himself, received a second game to star in at all is just awesome. Soma is my personal favorite character in the franchise, and the tactical soul system is just iconic. Bloodstained's Miriam may have taken cues from Shinoa in her visual design, but that shard-binding DNA is all Soma. The thing I love about Tactical Souls is that, aside from the obvious appeal of having a ton of skills and the thrill of any enemy potentially dropping one at any time, learning skills from enemy monsters in general is just a personal favorite gaming trope of mine. Whenever it does appear, I'm always so hyped. Blue Mages are my absolute favorite job class in Final Fantasy games, and the Vampire class in Bravely Default blew my mind. With this context, I think you can see why having a whole game built around the concept gets an almost viscerally enthusiastic reaction out of me. And a whole second game, no less, in this particular case. Narratively, Dawn isn't quite as strong as Aria, but I think it still has a cool concept. As a side note, Arya has a little bit of ludonarrative dissonance in the way Soma's ability, the power of dominance, is framed. Mechanically, it's basically copying monster abilities, but narratively, it's supposed to be the power to control monsters. This is all well and good, but every time Graham complains that the castle's monsters are under Soma's control, I'm like, bro, they all literally try and kill me on sight. Tangent aside, Dawn's idea of multiple competing Dark Lord candidates is neat, although I wish the character designs for Dimitri and Dario hadn't been quite so aggressively unappealing. This goes beyond the art style, too. The designs for the new characters in this game kinda suck ass. Having said that, the sprite work is a very large improvement over Arya's, with considerably larger and more detailed characters, monsters, and even weapons and soul skills. Dawn of Sorrow is an evergreen game for me. It's short, sweet, and just crazy fun. The simple addition of the doppelganger soul alone boosts the fun factor of its moment-to-moment -moment gameplay above Aria of Sorrow for me personally, as it allows the player to save two completely different equipment and soul loadouts to swap between at the push of a button. But just in general, it's more Egovania goodness, all of which is peak for the genre. 
exploring the castle, obtaining new weapons and powers, finding shortcuts between its interconnecting areas, and encountering new abominations to cut, fry, freeze, or blast your way through. Soul drop rates can be a bit abysmal at times, but I think the idea behind this is for each casual playthrough to feel different, or for players to keep cycling through New Game Plus in order to increase their soul stock. I really only have two criticisms for the main game, and one of them is kind of more of a personal taste thing. This subjective issue is that I really don't love most of the progression abilities in Dawn of Sorrow. Boss fights in Soma's games are always extra exciting because they mean a guaranteed new soul for your arsenal, but while the offensively oriented ones like Gurgoth, Aguni, Death, and Abaddon kick ass, the progression oriented ones are largely situational and uninteresting. Double jumping is a staple, but it would have been cooler if it was animated as a flap of Malthus's jet black wings rather than a dinky little mid-air flip. The Puppet Master is conceptually interesting, and could have been cool and perhaps had some more practical use if it could be thrown more than like two feet in front of you. But it can't, so it's little more than a glorified door key. Of course, the passive ability to move underwater is whatever, and don't even get me started on using the touchscreen to break ice blocks in like three rooms with the Balor Soul. I do really like the improved flying armor and Bat Company soul sprites, although the Bat form is noticeably slower than it was in Aria for some reason. My more objective complaint is the impact that Yoko Belnade's weapon synthesis shop has on the game's design. I respect the idea of keeping stronger weapons gated behind it to a degree because it encourages players to engage with it. The problem is that I feel like the developers took this too far to the point that there's much less gear to find as a reward for exploration than in most other Egovanias, and the gear you do find is a lot weaker and less exciting as a result. Oh, and also magic seals are a thing. I think all reviews of Dawn are contractually obligated to complain about magic seals. Honestly, what annoys me most about them isn't even that they're a pain in the ass, but that they're considered rewards for exploration. So much so that your reward for reaching the throne room in Dawn is the last magic seal. In Aria, you were rewarded for this milestone with Dracula's tunic, one of the best pieces of armor in the game, and the Black Panther soul, a super fun and practical mobility option. In Dawn, it's just a magic seal that nobody even wants. Regardless, none of these blemishes can ruin the overall experience of one of Symphony of the Night's favorite sons, and Daddy Alucard even makes his first playable appearance since Symphony in pretty much the single greatest alt character mode in all of Castlevania, Dawn of Sorrow's take on Julius mode. Alt character modes are consistently one of my favorite things about Egovanias. I have almost as much fun with the Richter and Maria modes in Symphony of the Night as I do with the main game, and I really appreciated Julius mode in Aria of Sorrow. Like, I love that even Soma's games don't compromise on giving you the classic Belmont experience as well. Julius mode in Dawn of Sorrow, though, is next level hype. This shit slaps. In what is essentially an homage to Castlevania III and its multiple heroes, Dawn's Julius mode starts you off as Julius Belmont, but allows you to also recruit Yoko Belnades and Alucard himself, and switch to them on the fly. Naturally, Julius mirrors Trevor from Castlevania III, Yoko mirrors Sypha, and Alucard mirrors, well, himself. Dawn of Sorrow was also years ahead of its time in pretending Grant never existed, despite Hammer being right there, but whatever. Julius has all the classic sub-weapons and the Grand Cross ability, Yoko has all three of Sypha's magic spells, and Alucard has both of his Castlevania three abilities plus the Gravity Boots from Symphony. I would have loved to see his forms of Wolf and Mist return too, but I suppose they would have been a bit redundant within Dawn's world design, and what we got is more than enough. And to top it all off, this mode is even framed as a follow-up to Dawn's non-canon bad ending, where Soma becomes the new Dark Lord and basically takes up Dracula's mantle. 
This means that the final boss has instead been replaced with a completely original fight against Soma, who uses a mix of classic Dracula shenanigans and some of the very same souls that the player has access to in the main game, including the Great Axe and Gaibun souls in his first form, and the Harpy, Larva, Aguni, and Abaddon souls in his second. The fan service is unreal, and for me, no revisit to Dawn of Sorrow is complete without also hitting up Julius Mode again. Honestly, I can gush about this game all day, but as unlike Dracula, I am but a pitiful mortal whose time on this earth is limited, I need to get to work on the next part of this little retrospective trilogy. So join me next time, if you will, as I gush about another personal all-time favorite of mine, Castlevania Portrait of Ruin. Portrait of Ruin is an interesting game for me in that it basically shot up from being my least favorite in the trilogy when I was younger to quite possibly my favorite nowadays, eclipsing even Dawn of Sorrow for me in terms of overall experience, despite Soma himself still being my personal favorite protagonist in the franchise. Portrait seems to be the relative black sheep of this trilogy amongst fans, but this largely comes down to people disliking its segmented map, which has simply never bothered me. While I do like having one big, cohesive map, the aesthetic variety that the titular portraits bring more than makes up for any segmentation, in my opinion. And the game does so much else right for me that even if I actively disliked the segmented maps, it would hardly matter. For starters, the premise alone is just really cool. While the video game industry is no stranger to direct narrative sequels, Castlevania is the only franchise I've ever seen which has had the balls to create sequels to much older entries, sometimes even in different gameplay engines and genres. Sure, you have obviously timed sequels like Simon's Quest and Symphony of the Night, which released immediately following their narrative predecessors, but Curse of Darkness released many years and entries after its narrative predecessor, Castlevania III, and Portrait of Ruin follows this trend, as it's a narrative sequel to the much older and relatively far-removed Castlevania Bloodlines. Numerous entries in the series cite dark periods in human history as the catalyst for Dracula's resurrection, but Bloodlines specifically takes place during World War I, and its sequel, Portrait of Ruin, takes place during the Second World War. I just think it's cool how much closer to home those feel as catalyzing events for Dracula's return. Anyway, Castlevania may not be known for its storytelling in the same way as Metal Gear, but it's had an admirable level of consistency and attention to detail, at least retroactively. Portrait has one of my personal favorite narratives in the entire franchise because it was written to connect to both the timeline's past and future, going as far as to directly reference Julius Belmont's Battle of 1999, which chronologically takes place after this game. Portrait's deuteragonist Jonathan Morris is the son of Bloodline's deuteragonist John Morris, and John's old partner Eric Lacard is a major character, with his daughters taking on a prominent role as well. Portrait in general has a really cool theme of duos, and there are multiple sets of characters who mirror each other to go along with this theme. The protagonists Jonathan and Charlotte essentially mirror John and Eric, and in turn, Eric's daughters Stella and Loretta also mirror the protagonists. These relationships also create an uneven thematic Venn diagram, however, because there is some asymmetry in their overlap. To hone in on the main story's primary two duos, however, we have Jonathan Morris and Stella Lacard as the martial fighters, and Charlotte Allen and Loretta Lacard as the magic users. Stella and Loretta serve as major antagonists for the bulk of the adventure due to being brainwashed and turned into vampires by the primary antagonist, Brawner. I find this really cool because it means that Stella and Loretta who in a happier timeline should have logically been Jonathan's greatest allies, given the relationship of their respective fathers, are now instead cast as some of his most dangerous enemies. This leaves a third party, Charlotte, to serve as Jonathan's partner, but also give us a nice symmetrical rivalry between the two duos. I don't know, I just love this. Stella and Loretta also have great designs and a fantastic musical theme. 
I really, really like them, and I think they're incredibly underrated one-off characters. Portrait also has an especially memorable incarnation of death, as he finally speaks again for the first time since Symphony of the Night, and his boss fight involves him essentially stance changing between two forms, one which is weaker to Jonathan's physical attacks, and one which is weaker to Charlotte's magical attacks. The presence of multiple factions with semi-complex relationships is another thing that gives it essentially my favorite narrative in the series, as while Death is certainly an enemy of Jonathan and Charlotte, he is no ally of Brawner, Stella, and Loretta, since Brawner does not seek Dracula's revival. Of course, the Lacard sisters aren't even true allies of Brawner, and as soon as they're freed from his brainwashing, rejoin the heroes, though they are, of course, conveniently too physically worn down to be of direct help going into the game's finale. They do, however, offer indirect help by performing the ritual which allows Jonathan to unlock the vampire killer's true power by battling the whip's memory of its most recent Belmont wielder. And the seal on the whip's power is a whole subplot unto itself, and Portrait of Ruin is just really, really cool, you guys. And of course, all that is to say nothing of the game's final boss, which is another duo fight, this time being a tag team of Dracula and Death the two most iconic bosses in the series, thus tying the game's overarching theme of duos together one last time at the very end. Guys, it just doesn't get much cooler than this. Now, when I was younger, I thought Portrait of Ruin felt like a sort of diet dawn of sorrow, since on the surface it's extremely similar, but doesn't have the tactical soul system, which had kind of spoiled me. Monster Souls did add a certain thrill to every single enemy encounter, since any old bog-standard kill could theoretically result in gaining a cool new ability, but returning to Dawn now, I felt like, in reality, a lot of souls are admittedly duds anyway. Many souls are not especially interesting or even practical to use, as conceptually cool as they may be. Jonathan's subweapons and Charlotte's spells, by contrast, have a much higher ratio of useful to useless ones, and between the two of them, it feels like there are about just as many special skills to play around with as there were souls in Dawn of Sorrow, to say nothing of how much easier and less RNG-based they are to obtain. On top of this, since Portrait isn't shoving Yoko's weapon synthesis shop down your throat, good weapons can actually be found by exploring again, making the act feel much more rewarding than it did in Dawn. And a lot of enemies still have random gear and skill drops with reasonably high drop rates anyway, so you'll still find cool shit by killing mooks here and there. Additionally, while all three of these games' visuals have aged very well, I prefer to play them on original hardware, and I have to say, the difference between Dawn and Portrait is like night and day. Dawn's sprites and environments, while still a tremendous increase in detail compared with those of its predecessor Aria, aren't nearly as detailed and fleshed out as Portrait's when looked at back-to-back -back on a DS screen. Say what you will about the low-budget anime art style the game's face portraits share, but as sprites you're looking at for 99% of the experience, Jonathan and Charlotte are gorgeous, as are Stella, Loretta, and pretty much all of the human characters in Portrait. Dawn also has a much more drab color palette, compared with Portrait's brighter, more saturated, and picturesque look. It also has appreciably more colorful sprites for its protagonists and antagonists. And while I know most players prefer a quote-unquote feeling of isolation in their Metroidvanias pretty much on principle, I find the adventuring duo concept extremely refreshing, and absolutely adore that Portrait allows you to swap between the characters operating solo, or have them move as an actual honest-to-goodness two-man unit, with both characters on screen. Each of these options also have their own benefits and drawbacks, which is just good design. Basically, having a partner out increases your DPS because they'll attack enemies and even cover your back independently, but if they get hit, it's taken out of your mana. Operating solo, of course, means that you have no backup or extra DPS, but you only have to worry about avoiding attacks yourself. 
When I play, I prefer to keep both out as often as is even remotely practical, but hey, if you prefer that feeling of isolation, you can still totally emulate it. That's player expression, baby. Lastly, Portrait's character movement, and by extension moment-to-moment -moment gameplay, is much faster than Dawn's, giving it a much snappier and more addictive game feel. Julius Mode in Dawn of Sorrow was Iga's first attempt at on-the-fly character swapping, and it crawled with the concept so that Portrait could run with it, as it feels much swifter and more fluid here. And while Soma and Jonathan are both proficient in a wide variety of weapons, there's just something about playing as a whip wielder in a Castlevania game. Swordsmen appear all over the industry, but whip users are much rarer, and rarer still are they the protagonists. Of course, Portrait has its share of problems too. For one, the quest system is abysmal. You can only even view up to five at a time, Old quests need to be completed before new ones even become available, and it's possible for careless players to permanently softlock themselves out of completing some of them. On top of this, they can't even be cancelled once accepted, so if you softlock an active quest, tough shit, you're now effectively one slot short on the quest list. Portrait basically just tells you come back in New Game Plus, bitch. Something else which bothers me is an even further compounding of my complaint from Dawn of Sorrow regarding boring progression abilities. As much as I love Portrait, it has some of the most boring progression abilities in the entire series, ranging from actual key items which act as literal door keys to riveting skills like pushing blocks out of the way. The Toad and Owl morph spells are more my speed, but they're only even needed in like one to two rooms a pop, and Portrait features the least environmental context for a flight ability of literally any Metroidvania I've ever played, Castlevania or otherwise. Lastly, the mastery system in place for Jonathan's sub-weapons is so obnoxiously ungenerous that of the absolute ton he has to choose from, it basically takes an entire run of the game just to master one or two, assuming you don't take a small eternity to grind and you're using the weapon in question exclusively. Mastering them isn't at all important to your overall experience, but a few of the quests involve accomplishing this, including the one which rewards you with the Alucard Spear, Eric Lacard's weapon from Bloodlines, and arguably one of the best weapons and biggest pieces of fan service in the game. To date, Jonathan Morris is the only Castlevania hero to wield both the Vampire Killer and Alucard Spear, but only if you take like an entire fucking day out of your real-world life to grind the Javelin sub-weapon, which isn't even that good. To end the discussion on one of my personal favorite entries on a brighter note though, Portrait 2 has a very cool little set of alt character modes, which, like the main game, are built around a duo character theme. While Dawn's Julius mode does remain the king of alt modes for me in concept and cast alone, Portrait's Richter mode definitely gives it a run for its money. As if Julius mode was essentially Castlevania 3 reimagined as an Egovania, then Portrait's Richter mode is essentially Rondo of Blood reimagined as an Egovania. It puts you in control of Richter Belmont and Maria Renard as a proper duo in Portrait's signature tag team style. And while I've always preferred Maria's older design from Symphony of the Night, I appreciate this mode's status as a Rondo callback specifically. The other majorly noteworthy alt mode, however, is Sisters Mode, and this one I have much more mixed feelings about. Sisters Mode is a gimmick mode, plain and simple, but unlike the majority of other alt character modes in Castlevania, it actually has a small narrative, which is really cool. Sisters Mode acts as a prologue to the events of Portrait, chronicling Stella and Loretta's arrival at the castle in an attempt to find and rescue their father, and culminating in their subjugation at Brawner's hands as they watch Eric die. The story itself is really just a couple of cutscenes bookending the experience, one at the beginning and one at the end, but it's an appreciated step to actually tie the mode into the main game's narrative, which is more than most other alt modes even attempt. I mean, even Dawn's Julius mode only has a couple of brief recruitment dialogues and a single cutscene right before the Soma fight. 
The problem with Sisters Mode is that it's a giant cock tease, especially for me, since I actually really like the characters. Stella and Loretta are fought as bosses in the main game. As such, they already have plenty of animations and a fleshed out moveset. Now to be fair, they are vampires when they're fought, so I imagine that the way they handle would have needed some adjustments, but it's not like concepts and assets weren't already in place. Unfortunately, however, Sisters Mode instead opts to be one giant, unimaginably easy touchscreen gimmick. The sisters are controlled via only the control pad, and attacks are executed by touching the DS's lower screen wherever you want a hurt box to appear. This combination creates a nasty pair of issues, one ludonarrative dissonance issue and one mechanical issue. Oh hey, a duo. Moving via only the control pad works mechanically because Stella and Loretta can move omnidirectionally, but this manifests as them eerily hovering around everywhere like a pair of vampires, even though this mode is supposed to take place while they're still human. I've seen some people hand wave this as their witches, but that's not really even accurate. Again, Stella and Loretta are thematic gameplay foils to Jonathan and Charlotte. They mirror them. For one thing, Stella isn't a magic user at all. She's a sword master and martial fighter, like Jonathan. Loretta is a magic user, but so is Charlotte, and at this point, they're both human. Stella and Loretta are canonically quite the mighty warriors, but Charlotte is canonically a genius prodigy of a mage, so if magic using humans could levitate like that, then I really don't see why Charlotte can't. And then of course there's the mechanical joke that this mode becomes when you relegate damage to the touch screen without putting so much as an invulnerability period on any enemy or boss. One of the few things that classic Vanias and Igavanias have in common is that when it comes to combat, they're fundamentally games about managing positioning and DPS. But since Stella and Loretta can move independently of where their attacks are landing, and absolutely machine gun DPS in a game that was not built for that kind of damage output outside of extremely limited use special skills, absolutely all combat becomes a complete joke bosses included. Lastly, because this mode is committed to being narratively consistent with the main story, certain boss fights are cut out from it. So you don't have the sisters fighting themselves, but you also don't have them fighting Brawner or Dracula. There's essentially no proper final boss at all. I would be 100% okay with this if the mode had fundamentally good design which added to the immersion, but with the gameplay system we ended up getting, I think I'd honestly have preferred if Sisters mode instead just had no story and was framed as playing as them as vampires. This would have better justified the eerie hovering as well as the absolute power trip of independent movement and DPS, and then all of the boss fights could have been included because why not? It's not canon anyway. What we got instead were some really cool ideas marred by incredibly lazy execution. I don't count this against Portrait as a whole because it's just a bonus that they didn't even need to include, but if Sisters Mode had lived up to its full potential, it could have easily been my favorite alt mode in the entire series after Dawn's Julius Mode. Instead, it is a mildly amusing novelty. Finally, I'm contractually obligated to acknowledge that old Axe Armor mode exists, but I don't care about it and have never played it. Its unlock condition is absolutely obnoxious, and it doesn't even feature a duo. I'd call it a joke, but it has actual gameplay, which to be fair is more than I can say about Sisters mode, but Stella and Loretta are bae, so I still care about Sisters mode more than old Axe Armor. Bite me, haha ha, funny vampire pun. To be honest, my most recent experience with Order of Ecclesia surprised me, in that it was sort of the opposite of my experience with Portrait of Ruin. When I was younger, Order of Ecclesia was my personal close second favorite to Dawn of Sorrow, but with Portrait now sort of low-key eclipsing even Dawn for me in a lot of ways, Order's actually fallen into third place, though not by an especially wide margin. Of course, that's not to say I don't love the heck out of it. I absolutely do, and I absolutely feel that it stands shoulder to shoulder with Symphony of the Night just as much as its two older DS siblings, but let's talk about it. 
Order of Ecclesia bears the distinction of having one of the more unique setups and protagonists in the series. While the vast majority of Castlevania games at least feature a Belmont or Belmont-adjacent character, whether they're in the spotlight or not, Ecclesia chooses to chronicle a period of time during which the Belmont bloodline was MIA, and the vampire killer along with it. As such, we are placed in control of the uniquely beautiful and powerful glyph wielder named Shinoa. As a member of the titular organization known as the Order of Ecclesia, Shinoa is a sort of witch who uses her own body as a weapon. She has an extremely striking design with some lavishly detailed sprite work. Ecclesia is one of the only entries in which I actually use the backdash, simply because her little cartwheel is so much fun to look at, what with the way her lengthy, jet-black hair swoops around as she does it. In fact, as great as Bloodstained Ritual of the Night is, I'll always kind of view Miriam as a Diet Shinoa, and a sort of legally safe XP of the character, since Iga was unfortunately unable to rescue her from Konami's clutches. Shinoa's glyphs are also highly reminiscent of Soma's tactical souls, although arguably a bit more mechanically distinct from them than Miriam's almost one-to-one -one shards. Rather than equipping weapons for standard attacks and glyphs for special skills and sub-weapons, Shinoa equips three glyphs at a time, two on her arms and one on her back. These glyphs can take on many forms, ranging from traditional Castlevania weapons and sub-weapons to more elaborate Charlotte-esque spells. And while I like this idea on paper and loved it unconditionally as a kid, returning to the game now, I found that it actually limited my options more than expanding them. For one thing, you're sort of encouraged to double up with the same glyph on both of Shinoa's arms. Since each arm can swing their weapon or fire off their spells back to back, I find it's often in the player's best interest to equip two copies of what an enemy or boss is weak to at once in order to maximize DPS, which you will want to do because Ecclesia is hard. Easily the hardest game in this trilogy by a considerable margin. The problem with this glyph doubling for me is that many of the glyphs with the most raw DPS are the ones which conjure up boring, ordinary melee weapons, like rapiers and axes. The thing is, even that wouldn't have to be a death sentence if it wasn't for the way in which Ecclesia's monster weakness system interacted with it. See, in Order of Ecclesia, even melee weapons come in different varieties. Similar to games like Etrian Odyssey, melee weapons can do one of three different damage types. I'm not really sure what they're called in-game, since all it shows you are icons, but I think of them as slash, stab, and blunt, based on the weapon types they're attached to. Every monster has multiple attack types they're either weak or strong against, whether they are physical or elemental magical attacks, and the first time you kill an enemy type, you'll get a readout on the second screen telling you their relationship to each attack type you hit them with. The reason this becomes an issue is because there's really no mechanically interesting functional difference between slash, stab, and blunt weapons. Their ranges and swing speeds are, for the most part, nearly identical. But enemies in Order of Ecclesia are so tough and tanky by Igavania standards that you basically need to interact with this weakness system, which often means needing to pause the action to switch to a different type of basically identical melee weapon multiple times in a single skirmish on a single screen. The glyph sleeve you receive early on does help mitigate the annoyance of this somewhat by allowing you to save three different glyph loadouts to swap to on the fly without pausing the action, but this then creates a new problem where instead of using the sleeve to save three interesting and different loadouts focused around magic or alternative positioning options for combat, kind of like how the doppelganger soul was used in Dawn of Sorrow, you simply end up saving three mechanically identical loadouts, which you swap between for what feels like totally arbitrary bureaucratic reasons. 
Shinoa has access to so many insanely cool glyphs in Order of Ecclesia, and most of them have even more theoretically practical applications than the lion's share of the weaker tactical souls in Dawn of Sorrow did, but the combat ends up being pretty hamstrung by its over-reliance on the weakness system, thanks to the way it interacts with the far more practical DPS options attached to multiple different flavors of short-range melee attacks. I love Shinoa's ability to transform into certain monsters in order to both bypass enemies of the same species and utilize their abilities herself, but these transformations are far too weak to make any serious use of. Shinoa's more extravagant magical spells are a treat to behold, and often cover a wide area of the screen to help keep her out of harm's way while firing them, but they take up so much more mana for so much less DPS, even against enemies which are weak to them, that it's usually more expedient to just go with the boring melee options anyway. Ultimately, despite how many of them were functional duds, I think Soma's tactical souls struck the better balance, since they acted as unique utility options meant to be used in conjunction with his melee weapons, which already provided more meaningful decision-making in terms of which to equip, thanks to their wider spread of organically different traits, such as range, swing speed, swing arc, and end lag. Since Dawn didn't hold player self-expression prisoner with an over-reliance on tanky enemies with specific weaknesses, you could actually choose weapons to match the general situation, or your preferred playstyle, rather than switching between functionally identical ones constantly based solely around which exact enemy you were targeting in that exact moment. Similarly to Portrait of Ruin, however, I find the most recurring criticism levied towards Order of Ecclesia is an aspect which I took no issue with whatsoever, its map. Despite its status as a Metroidvania, Ecclesia features by far the most segmented map of the DS trilogy, even more than Portrait of Ruins. I think what really bothers most players about this, though, is the fact that a number of them are almost completely horizontal corridors from one end of the area to the other. I completely understand this perspective, but it didn't really bother me personally for two reasons. Regarding the segmented map, I actually like this feature because of the way it's framed. In Order of Ecclesia, Shinoa doesn't spend the entirety of her adventure inside of Dracula's castle. Rather, she spends roughly the first two-thirds of it journeying to reach Castlevania, and then spends the final third inside of it. This totally works for me. I really have no complaints about it. Sure, some areas are pretty unapologetically horizontal in structure, but plenty of them do have verticality, with winding paths and loot-filled dead ends. And once you do reach Dracula's castle proper, Ecclesia has quite possibly my favorite incarnation of it to date, speaking in terms of aesthetics. I just really love whoever Dracula hired to do his interior decorating this time, especially for the foyer. But even beyond that, it has the kind of structure you would expect from the castle, that same elaborate, twisty, interconnected format that fans know and love even if it is a bit smaller than usual. The reason that the relatively flat areas leading to the castle don't bother me so much is because when combined with the game's sheer difficulty and feeling of being on a journey to the castle, they sort of make Ecclesia feel like an homage to, or perhaps even hybrid between, the classic Vanias and the Igavanias. The way that Shinoa is relentlessly forced into frequent, tense bouts on relatively simple terrain is highly reminiscent of the older classic Vanias to me personally. This ends up giving a good portion of Shinoa's journey a highly unique feel within the franchise as a sort of marriage between games like Simon's Quest and Symphony of the Night. Anyway, I've spent a weirdly large amount of time picking this game apart for a video ostensibly dedicated to gushing about it, but when Order of Ecclesia works, it really works. And the reason its blemishes stand out so much is because everything else in it is of such a consistently high quality. The music, the simple but fun narrative surrounding the relationship between Shinoa, Albus, and Barlow, the more interesting combat and traversal glyphs obtained once Castlevania is finally reached, and of course, the brutally difficult boss fights. 
If anything, Ecclesia may be a bit on the oppressive side of the difficulty scale for my taste, but for any gaming masochists out there, and I know there are plenty, you'll be hard-pressed to find an Egavania with as much sheer moment-to-moment -moment challenge as Shinoa's outing into Vampire Country. And while Ecclesia may have the smallest number of playable characters in the trilogy by far, the two it does have are by far the most unique in series history. Shinoa's wide assortment of glyphs and the way she handles them help her stand apart from the vast majority of previous series protagonists, to say nothing of the fact that she is the only female lead who has remained in the series canon. Her counterpart, Albus, however, is a power trip done right. He is everything I would have liked Stella and Loretta to be in the sisters mode of Portrait of Ruin. As the playable character in Ecclesia's sole alt character mode, Albus's moveset is derived wholly and astonishingly faithfully from his recurring boss encounter in Shinoa's story. In fact, if anything, I think they actually made him stronger when put in the hands of the player. However, while his potential DPS is almost as utterly ridiculous as Stella and Loretta's was, he actually has a nice variety of ranged attacks to choose from and still has to worry about his own positioning and the direction he's facing. All this combined with Ecclesia's already brutal default difficulty and the fact that, as usual, Albus's alt mode removes the player's ability to use potions means that Albus mode provides you with a power trip that still forces you to actually play the game on its own terms, within the confines of its core mechanics. Albus may utterly decimate his foes, but you still have to pay enough attention to keep him out of harm's way and actually look and wait for openings in boss attack patterns. While it is substantially easier than Shinoa's adventure, this mode is really excellent and well-crafted, in my opinion. An absolutely worthy successor to the DS Trilogy's brilliant previous alt modes, and an incredibly fun victory lap across Order of Ecclesia's macabre hellscapes after you've completed Shinoa's perilous journey to the pinnacle of Dracula's castle. I may have spent more time critiquing Ecclesia's more inelegant traits in this video than I originally intended to, but it bears emphasizing that, by and large, this game shares many of its greatest strengths with its Egavania predecessors. Exploration, finding and procuring increasingly powerful weapons and loot, and of course, combat with Castlevania's endless parade of night creatures and nightmare fuel. Some of Ecclesia's lows may be lower than those of its DS siblings, but some of its highs can potentially be even higher, depending on the player's priorities. I personally find Dawn and Portrait to be the more balanced experiences, but there's no arguing with the uniqueness of Shinoa and Albus as playable heroes, or the relentless brutality of Ecclesia's moment-to-moment -moment gameplay. I consistently die by far the most frequently when revisiting Order of Ecclesia, and I know that's all the endorsement it needs for some players. And that brings us to the end of this little Spooptober Castlevania marathon. If you've been here from the beginning, then thanks for sticking around. And if you only just jumped in here, then hey, there's two more of these videos waiting for you. I generally focus this channel on game-related content, but if anyone's interested in me covering the Netflix Castlevania series, let me know in the comments. I think it's a milestone in game-to-television adaptation quality, and I'd love to gush about it sometime as well. In the meantime, thanks for watching, and Happy Halloween! And of course, if you enjoyed this video, then don't forget to drop a spooky like and a ghoulish subscribe! Ooh!